Colleagues, friends, uh, audience members, good evening and a very warm welcome to you. My name is Di Reddy. I'm um, Interim Vice-Chancellor of the University of Cape Town uh, for all of one week so far. Um, but very pleased to be here with you. Um, we have, uh, in addition to everybody here, we have, I believe, a large number of um, friends, audience members who are with us online. And of course we have alumni, we have friends of UCT and colleagues from all around the world. Uh, so it's, it's a wonderful, it's a real pleasure to have you here. It's a very special event. The University of Cape Town established the Vice Chancellor's Open Lecture precisely to provide an opportunity for anyone whether or not they are connected or associated with UCT, um, to hear firsthand from those special individuals who have distinguished themselves in their respective areas of research and expertise and who are able to inspire us <coughs> to greatness. And this evening we have one such special individual with us that is Professor Edward Moser of the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Trondheim. He will be talking to us on the subject of neuroscience and Joe Raimondo will introduce him shortly. Um, neuroscience is the scientific study of the nervous system, its functions, its disorders. It is by default hugely multidisciplinary, combining physiology and anatomy, of course, but a host of biological, mathematical, physical, and computational sciences. All of these with the aim of understanding the biological basis of learning, memory, behavior, perception, consciousness. So these surely are amongst the biggest questions, the biggest scientific questions today as we continue to strive to understand ourselves and the world around us. I've um, invited Associate Professor Joseph Raimondo to provide us with a more neuroscientific introduction to uh, Professor Moser. Uh, Professor, Professor Raimondo is a cellular neuroscientist from the Division of Cell Biology in our Department of Human Biology here, and also a member of the Neuroscience Institute. Joe, could I ask you please to introduce our speaker? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Reddy. Uh, Professor Edfat Moser has made fundamental contributions to our understanding of how uh, spatial location and spatial memory are encoded and computed within the brain, and of Particular note is his role in the 2005 discovery of grid cells in the entorhinal cortex. And as you will no doubt hear much more about in a moment, uh, grid cells provide the brain with an internally generated coordinate system, which is absolutely essential for navigation. And so for this uh, remarkable discovery, uh, he together with his uh, long-term long, long colleague, Maybrick Moser, uh, were awarded half of the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine in 2014. I, I first heard of Prof. Moser's work uh, quite a while ago through two very close friends, Tor and Hannah Stensola, who are a Norwegian neuroscience couple uh, I met at Oxford, and at the time they were affectionately referred to as the Mini Moses. <laughs> and it was through them that uh, I was privileged enough to visit the Moses Institute in Trondheim in Norway in 2009. Now Trondheim is much further north uh, than Cape Town is south. So when the Moses would have started uh, their laboratory there in 1996, it was really something of a, a neuroscience uh, backwater. So I think the, the Moses bravery and vision in returning to their home country to set up and ultimately perform world-leading neuroscience uh, 
really made a, a massive impression uh, on me at the time and I think should serve as a, as a huge inspiration for, for all of us here at UCT's Neuroscience Institute uh, down, down at the tip of Africa. So I think with that, uh, it's with tremendous excitement that I hand over to Professor Edward Moser. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Vice Chancellor. And uh, also, thank you, everyone who has invited me here, Graham, not the least, and also David and uh, Ursel, who's taken care of me for several days before uh, we came here. Um, so, today I have learned about uh, the Institute, uh, and uh, it's very exciting to see how it is developing. I'm very pleased that uh, South Africa is taking uh, part in uh, the development of uh, what I think is one of the fastest uh, developing sciences uh, at this time. And uh, it takes time to build an institute, but uh, you are really on track. And uh, I heard many ambitious, uh, um, exciting talks today. So uh, it has some similarities with the institute that uh, uh, we built up in Trondheim over the years because we also started from scratch and uh, it just shows that uh, anything is possible. So uh, what I want to do today is to uh, share with you some of uh, the work uh, in Trondheim about uh, that we're doing on uh, the neural mechanisms of uh, space and time in particular. But let me first start out with um, yeah, I want to uh, start out with one of the big challenges in uh, science, which I often uh, refer to as uh, breaking the barrier between psychology and physiology. And that refers to where I started myself as a young student uh, many, many years ago. Uh, I studied psychology, uh, not medicine, but I really wanted to understand uh, the neural basis, the brain's basis for psychological phenomena for behavior, for thinking, for planning, for feelings. So um, there hasn't been much uh, over the years. Uh, uh, scientists have not really been able to um, explain well how uh, those two levels interact. I'm now talking about uh, several decades ago uh, when I entered the field in the 1980s. Uh, and uh, for good reasons, because uh, the brain, which you will now see in the movie here, consists of uh, something around 86 billion neurons, plus minus, uh, each of which have 10,000 connections, or synapses as we call them, with other cells, and uh, they are excitable, they send signals over the synapses, here you see one, and then neurochemicals go over and excite uh, or inhibit the cell on the other side. And this happens then in about 10 to the 15th uh, connections, uh, among brain cells. Um, the size of these synapses, uh, not much more than one to two micrometers, uh, depending on what you measure. But you can imagine it is many, it's small, it's distributed. So how at all can we observe this? Uh, it, it's a very hard task. But there has been some advances. And I want to go back to some 60, 70 years back in, in time, uh, a little bit before I started uh, myself, but these uh, are some of the foundations that um, were laid, uh, that formed the field. And, and now particularly talking about the linkage of uh, physiology and psychology, or how can we explain, based on activity in neurons in the brain, uh, the phenomena that we experience, uh, the psychology of the brain in a way. And uh, much of that exploration started out in what you call the sensory systems. It could be in vision, uh, in hearing, in olfaction, and so on. But, sen but vision has really led the field. And that then brings me to the 50s, when uh, first David Ubel developed uh, the tungsten electrode, which uh, uh, was good enough for measuring activity from single neurons. You could even do that in, in animals that... Uh, were awake or anesthetized. <coughs> and what they then, uh, David Jubel, together with Torsten Wiesel, uh, what they did was that they recorded activity from um, the first part of uh, the cortex in the visual system, called the visual cortex uh, area uh, V1. And what they found 
um, is what is illustrated in this diagram here. So what you see here is um, is um, uh, let's see. You see um, the activity of one cell. So uh, each time there is a vertical bar here, th this cell is active. And these are bars or edges or contours that are presented to the animal. And then you can see that, uh, that uh, this cell, for example, responds very strongly to vertical uh, or semi-vertical uh, lines, but not so much to horizontal or, 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 or other lines. So, in other words, what they found was that cells in the visual cortex respond to edges and contours of certain orientations. So these are the building blocks of, of vision, and it's beginning a beginning of understanding how the brain works and how it could give rise to something just like sensing something or even perceiving it, having a feeling of what you see. So, but this was at the bottom of the brain, as I sometimes call it, because uh, this is a visual system. If your uh, inputs come in from the bottom here, you have the retina, the eye, the, the thalamus, and then it comes in here. And this is where uh, they did uh, most of their observations and then all of this is much more complicated and uh, until recently well even now we don't know that much about those areas so uh, so I said that uh, this was the beginning so the bottom of the brain kind of but uh, as a psychologist uh, I really wanted to start at the other end I wanted to understand uh, the higher level brain functions like thinking and planning and memories and um, then you need to go up in, in the complexity and up in the, in the brain systems. So that led uh, me to become interested in the hippocampus. You see the arrow there? I'm not sure if they have to use this one anymore. <laughs> but uh, um, this is, uh, hippocampus is an area that, uh, where a lot of research has been done uh, and we know quite a lot about it. And we know that it's involved, for example, in uh, space and in time, and not the least in how space and time are put together to form memories. But one reason for being interested in space and time, and why I will dedicate this lecture to that topic, is that uh, these are brain functions that are present before experience. So um, it's very hard to uh, imagine anything you experience without space and time. It just is there, and of course this brings us to Immanuel Kant, who, uh, who proposed already at the end of the 1700s that, uh, that the structure of the mind uh, is constrained, is constrained by space, time, and he also mentioned causality. Of course there are many other such limitations too, but these um, constraints decide how we experience the world and we can't experience them without. And it's kind of uh, the opposite of the sensory approach to understanding the brain because we're starting on the inside, starting with what just is there and is independent of the sensory inputs uh, that they get into our brain. So if we want to underst uh, understand the fundamentals of how the brain works, that uh, one may argue for uh, studying space and time. I want to begin with space and then I switch uh, to time towards the end. So uh, there isn't a single uh, part of the brain that is important for uh, space because space is so fundamental that it's everywhere. But nonetheless, there are some areas of the brain that are extremely important. And uh, two of them are shown here. So in red, there is the hippocampus. This is a human brain. You have the medial, the temporal lobe on the sides behind your ears. And, um, and then on the inside, as the brain uh, curves around, uh, but still in the cortex, you have uh, uh, the hippocampus. With uh, people who have uh, lesions or damage in the hippocampus, uh, have severe problems with forming new memories, but they also can't find their way. And uh, they have problems for putting uh, events into sequences and, and learning. So it might good, be a good place to, to uh, uh, look. Um, the entorhinal cortex, which is the blue structure that you see outside, is the connection between the hippocampus and the rest of the cortex. Not much has been uh, learned about uh, the entorhinal cortex until recently. It's sort of been uh, um, terra incognita. People uh, have not known much about it. Uh, but uh, we will see that there are some interesting things going on there. But the problem with the human brain is that it's inaccessible, it's a very, very complex, and perhaps not the best place to start. And for that reason, 
much of the research uh, in neuroscience or uh, is done uh, with uh, animals. Um, and then if you start from the human brain with its uh, 86 billion neurons, uh, you can go substantially towards the left uh, to through monkeys, but then to rats, to mouse, and uh, for the rat, 200 million only, for the mouse, 70 million, uh, with a fruit fly down to 200,000, and even with uh, the nematode uh, C. elegans, just 302 neurons. Uh, but even the 302 neurons of, of uh, C. elegans, it's very hard to understand how they work together. So uh, there's no reason to start at, the, at the, the, the most difficult. On the other hand, you also want to understand behaviors, brain functions that are somewhat relevant to humans. So you don't always want to go down to, to, uh, to see elegance. So quite often people end up in the middle and in the middle is often with rodents, rats uh, before, now much more mice. Uh, and this is what uh, led John O'Keefe in 1971 to record activity from the hippocampus in freely moving rats. Uh, looking for uh, fundamentals of memory, but finding something else. So these rats were running around in boxes, in mazes and so on, while he had for the occasion connected electrodes that were so thin that they could pick up electrical signals from single neurons, and he could then see how these single neurons were active while the rat was running around and doing things. And I'll show now a movie. Um, so. I will, uh, when I play this, you will see a rat running around in a box. It's running around to pick up small pieces of chocolate because they like chocolate. And just a trick we used to get them to run around and visit every possible place in the box. And at the same time, you will hear sounds. And those sounds are electrical potentials, the action potentials of, of a single cell in the hippocampus. And you will at the same time see a red dot each time the cell is active. So one cell in the hippocampus. So you hear when it's active. It's active whenever the rat is in the upper left corner. And when the rat is at other places in the box, this cell is not active. And because it's active only at one place, O'Keefe called this a place cell. Um, and you can also see the place cell in color code uh, at the bottom. Uh, it's active at the top left part. And to the left, uh, uh, John O'Keefe, actually to the right in the left picture, and uh, Lynn Nadel. Um, I show them because they proposed, based on these uh, findings, that the hippocampus is a site of a map in the brain that encodes where you are and also encodes experiences about where you are. So this was in the 70s. Much was learned about these place cells, but still they lived in, in relative isolation because it's, as I said, in the middle of the brain. And, uh, how do they speak to the rest of the world? But then, 10 years later, or 15, um, Jim Rank and Jeff, uh, Jeff Taube um, at uh, Stony Brook in, uh, or at, uh, in Brooklyn in New York showed that um, there are other cells in a different part of, uh, of um, uh, the brain outside the hippocampus where you can record cells that not respond, do not respond to position, but they respond to the orientation, the direction that you are facing. So they, again, this was rats, rats were running around, and each cell was active only when the rat was uh, heading in a certain direction. For example, this cell was only active when the rat was heading between 240-300 degrees, another one might be at 180, and the third one at 60 degrees, and so on. So again, a map, but this map is for direction. But obviously, as a map of direction and a map of position should probably speak together. They are connected through this other area, the blue area that I showed, that's called entorhinal cortex. So it might make sense to look there. And that's what we did in 2005. So uh, we started recording cells there, expecting to find some sort of spatially tuned cells. But um, what you will see in the video now is that you see for one single cell in this area, entorhinal cortex, will see a white dot each time the cell is active. You will see that they are active at certain positions, but many positions, and those positions form clusters that uh, are very regularly uh, distributed in the space. So each cell in this blue area in the entorhinal cortex is active at a number of positions, um, and those positions uh, form a very regular pattern. So you can see that uh, also to the right. So in background, you see a great race. That's where the animal has, uh, the rat has been walking. 
And in black dots, you see uh, where the cell was active, and you can see how symmetric and beautiful this is. It um, can be described as a repetition of, of equilateral triangle, triangles, or if you want, uh, you can see it as a repetition of a hexagon or even a rhombus if you want. But uh, the same pattern is uh, repeated uh, all the time. Uh, and uh, it forms a grid that covers the environment, a coordinate system, uh, as uh, Joe said, and uh, because it forms this grid, it's called these cells, uh, you call them grid cells. So that's where we were in 2005. But then it turned out that uh, these are not the only spatially tuned cells there. So um, to the left, you see another type of cell. So these are cells that are active only along the local borders of the environment. So this one, for example, red means high activity, blue means low activity. So this cell is active only on the right side of the, the box, uh, except for the, the one at uh, the bottom, which is, also, which is actually also active at the right side. Sorry, so it's all fine. This is a right side uh, cell. Another one might be on the left side, the third one on the top, and, and so on. So these are cells that define the borders. So they're completely different from the grid cells, but still intermingled with them. And then to the right, you see a third type of cell that we only find quite recently, which are cells that um, that respond to locations defined by uh, objects. And an object could be, for example, this Lego tower that you see in the middle of this box where a mouse is walking around. And uh, in this particular case, for the upper, um, on, the, on the upper diagram, you see that when you introduce the object, which is the circle on the in the right part, then you see this cell is active to the left of it, approximately 20 centimeters to the left. And at the bottom, you can see if you move the uh, object uh, from uh, in the middle to the more southwest part, then you see that this cell is still active a certain distance away on the north side. So these cells are form vectors uh, compared with reference to, uh, to um, salient landmarks in the environment. So it's a very different way of encoding position where you use a vector relationship to prominent landmarks instead of using the grid, which is sort of a, a lattice that just covers the entire environment. And these two obviously must speak together. So um, these cells do not only exist in rats and mice. So they have been found, first they were found in uh, bats in uh, 2011. And why is that interesting? So that's because bats are not small rats and not small mice. They are complete on a completely different branch of the uh, mammalian evolutionary tree. So the fact that they are there as well, that means that uh, they, uh, these cells must have evolved quite early uh, in evolution. They have been found in monkeys and in humans. Slight differences, but uh, nonetheless, they are there. So it's probably something that's quite universal to, to mammals. So that's where we are, uh, where a few years ago. So we now know that the spatial system contains a number of types of cells with unique uh, correlations to the external world. Some respond, uh, form a coordinate system, others uh, respond to borders, yet others respond to directions, and there are others that respond to speed, which I didn't mention, and yet others that respond to um, locations or objects, and so on. So these are the elements of spatial coding. But if you really want to understand how space is encoded in the brain, we can't stop at single cells. This is all happening in the interaction of hundreds to thousands to ten thousands of cells that work together and that do things together that you can never see in, uh, reflected in the individual cell. That's at least very difficult to see it because it's really a collective behavior. So in order to try to get to that level, uh, one has to have use new tools. And that's where uh, exciting things now happen, because new tools have become available. I will start first with uh, uh, the so-called neuropixels probe. So it's a different type of electrode. So previously, the electrodes we used were very th uh, thin metal strings that were uninsulated at the end and could pick up uh, uh, usually activity from one, two, three cells at the same time, maybe a few more, but not, not a lot really. These are actually computer chips that are, are, um, have lots of recording sites uh, along the electrode. So you see that at the bottom uh, right here. So there are two versions. The first version that came uh, about five years ago uh, is shown uh, at the top, and then a more modern version, 2.0, at the bottom. 
the difference is essentially that the, the new version 2.0 uh, has four electrodes. They, they appear like a comb uh, and allows you to record uh, through these many sites. You can actually record many thousands of cells at the same time instead of just 10 at the best, right? So it's a real revolution. Now, uh, and that is shown here, an example to the left now. So this is a subset of the cells in one recording. So this is work of uh, two postdocs in the lab. Uh, Richard Gardner and Eric Hermansen was uh, in the maths department. So this is a collaboration with the maths department in um, uh, at NTNU. Um, and um, why do we need maths? You'll very soon uh, understand that. But this just shows uh, maps of the activity of 149 out of the 2460 cells that were recorded in that experiment. And you see these are all grid cells, all the grid cells of a certain type that, um, that have similar spacing and, and orientation. So then the question is not what do all of these do individually, what do they do together? That's the question. And uh, you can start out by showing the activity of all those 149 cells there. Um, so this shows a timeline, about five seconds, and each line is the activity of one neuron. And um, the matrix is the whole activity, all of them. And then you can take time slots, like the, the, the red, um, um, red um, histogram that you see there. So, um, so what are the possibilities? In principle, those 149 cells can vary independently. If they do, you can plot that in a 149-dimensional coordinate system where each axis is, uh, shows the activity of each cell. Um, but um, luckily, those cells are not um, um, totally independent. That means you can actually break down the number of dimensions. You don't need, need to imagine the activity moving around in this 149-dimensional coordinate system, which would be pretty hard to visualize. But you can break it down to the main dimensions and even down to three or even two, and you can explain much of their activity. And if you do that using special uh, techniques that are used uh, in, in many fields, um, principal component analysis is, is the new, uh, has all, always been around, but there are many other techniques now that are not linear. And what you get is this. So what you now see here is a point cloud where each point is the activity, the joint combined activity in this red time slot. So each point is a given point of time, and in this uh, not 149 dimensional system, but broken down to three dimensions, uh, one, you see each uh, a dot for each time. And then you see, um, first of all, that those uh, time points form a cloud that form a torus or a donut, if you want. Um, and the other thing is that you see the movement of activity. Um, so times that are, uh, points that are close in time are connected with this red line. And you can see that actually as the rat is moving around in this box, the activity moves around on this torus and always stays there, never leaves the torus. So um, I will very soon explain why this is uh, uh, significant. but. Let's just be sure that it actually is a torus, because sometimes these point clouds are not so beautiful. Uh, and you can do that. Uh, there are techniques from the mathematical field of topology where you can count the number of holes. And in the case of a torus, you would have uh, uh, two rings in, um, in one dimension, and you would have one in two dimensions. So two dimensions would be inside of the torus, and the one dimension is the ones that are, are shown there. And uh, with a... a, a with an approach or a technique that's called persistent cohomology, you can then count this. And what you now see here, uh, to the left and to the right, you, um, I will not explain how this is done, but what you see is that there are some long lines. And the long lines illustrate um, the holes that are very long, uh, significant, very clear, and also stand out from the noise. The noise is given by the shuffling, which is the, the orange uh, colored uh, um, area uh, to the left. So you see, in one dimension, H1 there, you have two holes. In two dimensions, you have one hole. So that's when the rats are running around in the box. But when they are uh, walking on a maze, uh, you still see the same. And then, more importantly, when they are sleeping, same thing again, right? So 
two holes in one dimension and one in two dimensions, both when they are REM sleep, that's when we dream. And uh, so dream sleep in humans, uh, that's when they move they rapidly move their eyes, so that, that kind of sleep. And the other type of sleep, slow way sleep, is when the deep sleep, that's again, when the rats are sleeping, you still have the activity moving around on this torus. So that means the grid cells, in a sense, continue to be grid cells, even if the animals don't move around, which then means that this activity is created by the brain inside the brain itself. It's nothing that comes in from the outside. This is created by the brain, and that's why this is uh, uh, significant, because I, I don't have time to explain this in, in any detail, but let me just say that there are theories about how the brain, uh, how cells in the brain and in this part of the brain have to be connected together in order to get such a torus. So this was predicted already uh, implicit from work that was done more than 20 years ago, um, but you, there's no way you could record activity from many enough cells that you actually could see these uh, uh, donut-shaped uh, uh, point clouds. And uh, this is now possible with the new, uh, with the new technologies and actually shows then that uh, the activity of um, these space coding cells is actually a result of what the brain creates by itself. It's not the result of what comes in from the outside. And yes, guess what? This is what uh, Immanuel Kant suggested in the 1700s, that uh, the way we perceive the world through space is actually created by the brain itself. We can't escape it, not even when we sleep. So, um, but then regarding technology, there are also some other ways that we can watch cells. And over the last uh, 30 years, there really has been um, um, a revolution in how you, in, in visualization of, um, of uh, neural activity and in, uh, in big neural populations. And that's where uh, microscopy, two-photon microscopy uh, comes in. So uh, myself, star I started with uh, the other approach where they record electrical signals and that's what I've done throughout my life. But uh, in 2013, I think, I visited Tobias's uh, lab uh, Tobias Bonhoeffer, and, uh, and then we got started with uh, two-photon microscopy, where you essentially can uh, image uh, through microscopes the activity of cells that encode, uh, um, encode uh, that have a genetically encoded calcium uh, uh, signal, so that you can image the activity, the calcium, the amount of calcium in the cell, and this is a way then to indirectly. Uh, um, to indirectly um, um, show the changes in activity in neurons, um, but the advantage again being that you can actually see them. But one problem uh, was always that uh, if you wanted to do that, you had to put the animal under the microscope. So obviously you can't run around in a box like you did, uh, like I showed you. If you really want to see the animal behaving naturally, you had to somehow make uh, the microscope much, much smaller. And um, this is uh, work that has been going on for 20 years, but uh, finally it has reached a stage where uh, you can actually have a mouse carry a two, two gram uh, microscope on his head and connect it through cables to, uh, to the rest of the equipment and you can actually image the activity of uh, the work. And this is work of uh, Wei Jian Song, who is uh, uh, a postdoc in our lab and who developed this uh, now uh, and it was published last year, so I'll show you this microscope, then uh, let me just, uh, it can image a surface of about half a millimeter by half a millimeter, and uh, several planes under each other, and uh, if I now go to, yeah, th this just shows, uh, this shows uh, the behavior of the mouse when it's running around with this microscope on its head. So to the left, no microscope, to the right, an old-fashioned microscope, too heavy, and you can see the mouse just runs a little bit and then sits in the corner, doesn't want to <laughs> run more. But in the middle is with the new one, and you can see you can't distinguish it from, from one that doesn't carry a microscope any longer. So it's just light enough, and the, the cable that connects it is flexible enough. And now you can see here the activity of uh, the calcium uh, levels changing in uh, some hundreds, actually a total of more than 1,000 cells uh, in the visual cortex while the mouse is running around in a box. You see the mouse uh, connected with a cable there, 
and uh, running around in, uh, let me see, that one, running around in the box and at the same time you can see uh, the cells blinking, turning on and off, so each time they blink they uh, um, fire action potentials or are active, uh, or at least are very active. So you can see uh, the distribution of activity over the cells through this microscope when uh, the mouse is doing um, whatever uh, it wants to do. And uh, I'll show you that this can be used now on any type of behavior. So to show that this um, microscope doesn't um, prevent the animal from performing natural behaviors, we train the mouse to run vertically on a tower, a 20 centimeter high tower, and the mouse does it very easily. It's totally vertical, but no problem, because there is a biscuit on top, it eats the biscuit. <laughs> and then it jumps down. At the same time, you can see the activity in the entorhinal cortex with the grid cells uh, lighting up each time the cells are, are active. And again, you can, uh, in this case, uh, just a few hundred cells, but enough that you can uh, totally figure out the dynamics or the interactions between uh, the cells. And that led us then to, in, in a different paper, we, where we, for the first time, used this type of microscope. So it's a work together with Tobias uh, group, where we actually then uh, use this to image grid cells, cell direction cells, and, and other cells in the entorhinal cortex while the mouse was running around in a box, and you can see the blinking cells again. And uh, what we found is then shown to the bottom here, where you can see that the grid cells shown in red, and you, you can see the object vector cells shown in blue, <coughs> and uh, we, it's the first maps of uh, how these cells are uh, are distributed in the space circuit of the entorhinal cortex. You can see that they are intermingled, but still they form clusters. And uh, there's, for good reasons they form clusters, because uh, for these cells to create a spatial map, then you actually need to have similar cells connect to each other. And that's much easier if they're close to each other than if they're far, far away. So uh, now, um, for the remaining time, I want to speak a little bit about time, which is uh, much more recent that we got interested in this. But uh, space and time don't come together and form memories, so it's uh, absolutely uh, natural to look for this. And this starts out with the work of um, PhDs, then PhD student uh, Albert Sau, who uh, um, worked in uh, the lab in Trondheim for almost um, seven, eight years, from about 10, 2008 to almost 2016. And um, he was very ambitious, and uh, we let him start out on the other part of entorhinal cortex, the lateral entorhinal cortex, LEC. MEC is where all the space cells are. Uh, but LEC was an area, and is an area, that is poorly understood. We don't really know what's going on there. And he recorded activity from cells there, and for many, many years we understood nothing, because uh, the signal changed all the time. Nothing was stable, and he was technically really skilled, so it really puzzled us, and um, it was just in that area. And he recorded them with uh, rats running around in boxes like before, but 12 times instead of one time. And finally, uh, then it started to appear to us that these cells actually um, change over time. It's real. Um, so uh, the activity of these cells drifts over time. And you see four example cells here. So uh, this is now a sequence of recordings in, I think it's 12 different uh, trials, 12 boxes after one another. And uh, you can see how the activity goes up and down. So for example, in the top cell here, uh, you can see that within a single uh, trial of 10 minutes in that box, the activity starts low and then goes, ramps up gradually, and does so again next time, and next time, and so on. Other cells uh, might go down instead, and yet other cells uh, go down or up on a longer time scale. But it became again clear to us that because really beautiful cells, uh, examples of cells that ramp up or ramp down over time, are quite rare though everything changes over time. And again, it became clear, you can't understand the brain by, uh, on the, by observing one cell at a time. You need to uh, view hundreds, thousands of cells at the same time. And then came the NeuroPixels recordings quite recently. So this is work still not published, but uh, 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 we have quite a lot of data now. So this is a work of uh, Ben Cunter, 
he is recording at the same time from both the lateral entorhinal cortex, the medial entorhinal cortex and the hippocampus and sometimes reaching more than 1000 cells in each of the brain area and finding then uh, that um, if you then again plot this in a very high dimensional uh, coordinate system with um, one axis or one dimension for each cell so if you have n cells it is n uh, dimensions and of course very impossible to see how the activity mo would move around there uh, unless you break down to fewer dimensions and if you do dimensionality reduction for example principal component analysis you can break it down to for example two two dimensions and then you can see if you can still explain enough of the activity to see some pattern and that's what we find here so this shows two um, two of the primary uh, dimensions and um, if you now go to the left diagram you see many dots and you see some circles each circle is one minute of uh, the experiment a total of 10 minutes and you can see how this uh, and color indicates the, the session time so beginning is uh, white and uh, and uh, middle is red and then uh, end of the, uh, the last 10 minutes is, is black and you can see how it starts in this uh, state space as we call it to the left and then moves smoothly over to the right and then comes to may, maybe i dare to press him on. we'll see if that's a bit scary but uh, yeah there okay you can see how it moves smoothly through this state space in the lateral entorhinal cortex. Whereas in the other brain areas, like in the medial entorhinal cortex, where you have the grid cells, or in the hippocampus area, CA1, you can see that it just stays in one spot all the time. It's stable. But in the lateral entorhinal cortex, the activity actually moves. As time passes, the activity moves through, through this uh, space. Very systematically, always happens. And... Uh, you can then see at the top here that uh, if you measure the distance that activity travels in this space, then uh, you can see in the lateral entorhinal cortex, is the top one here, it is actually uh, moving uh, a lot, whereas it doesn't move more than in the shuffled random data in the other areas. And this is uh, smoothness, uh, it's the opposite of uh, what you call tangling. So tangling is if it just moves around itself and gets totally messed up. That's what you see in, in the uh, medial entorhinal cortex and in the hippocampus here. But in the lateral entorhinal cortex, uh, it, the activity is actually repulsive. It goes away from itself. And this is obviously correlated with time, with the passage of time. <coughs> the question is then, is this an internal clock in the brain? And the answer is not quite. Because if you first of all look at the act movement of the activity in um, in uh, uh, in one trial, then you can see that this is one circle per minute, and it's it's a large distance in the beginning, and then they get closer and closer and closer. Uh, so that means that this is not linear with the passage of time. It slows down as as uh, it's always most movement in the beginning when things are new and exciting. Um, so this just shows the same, but uh, this is uh, at the bottom you see an experiment where time passes on the x-axis and then distance is uh, distance in these uh, state space plots here. Uh, and it is distance from the previous point, so, uh, b so between point 1 and 2, 2 and 3 and so on. And you can see here at the vertical line there's one point that is far, far above the others. It's really a jump in this uh, diagram. And again here. And what happens there? Well, it's that an, a job object, a Lego tower, for example, is put into the box. Something really exciting to uh, a mouse or a rat that's just running around and not much is happening. And then it is a jump. So I think this shows that while the activity in this lateral part of entorhinal cortex moves around with time, then um, it is still not linear. It is when important things happen, uh, it moves much faster. When it's boring, then it moves much slower. So um, um, I think uh, this is the way the, the brains uh, this part. So time is all over the brain. So it is not a time area of the brain. But this part of the brain uh, expresses the passage of time in a way that is related to the flow of experience and the flow of experience is interpreted by the rest of the brain 
So whether it's important, whether there's nothing. So if you sit in a waiting room and nothing happens, then uh, then you may imagine that activity may move slower. And if lots of things happen, then it moves much faster. But uh, we can come back to that if you want in in, in the questions. So finally, let me see uh, say a few words about uh, the order of events too, because time is not only duration. Time is also order of uh, events, and that we have recorded. Uh, in another experiment, this is the work of uh, Soledad Gonzalo Cogno, who is a postdoc in the lab, and she has been uh, recording activity in mice that run on a ball. And uh, this is in a dark uh, room, nothing happens, it's completely uh, boring. There's no rewards uh, for running, but they just run naturally, and there's no stimulation, everything is dark. Uh, so this is to strip off all experience and then see what is the internal activity in uh, now we are back to the medial entorhinal uh, cortex and she's using um, imaging to uh, to um, visualize this and what you see here then if you do this under this is uh, the old type of microscope where they run in one place and you have them directly under a big microscope uh, and then you can uh, then again as before visualize the activity uh, as you saw previously. Uh, sorry, I forgot to turn on the lights. <laughs> okay, that, like that. But now you don't see anything. So <coughs> keep it. Uh, now I can turn it on. Uh, sorry, that one. Um, so uh, if you measure this activity, first in individual cells, you can actually see that when they are doing this task, it is strictly oscillatory. So uh, on the x-axis you have time, on the y-axis you have autocorrelation, the correlation with itself. You can see it's cyclic. But what is interesting here is that the length of each cycle is about something in the order of one minute. So it's a really, really slow oscillation in this brain. I mean, we know a lot about oscillations in the brain, but usually they are many times per second. Could be, for example, 10 times per second or even 100 sometimes. But this is uh, one, one cycle is about one minute, so it's extremely slow. And this happens in synchrony under these conditions in a very large number of cells. And uh, this just shows the same, and you can do it even with neuropixels probes, you find the same. But what is more interesting is that when all these cells cycle at this very, very slow uh, frequency, you can also arrange the cells uh, according to the sequence in which they fire. So if you just plot the cells randomly, of course you don't see anything, that's what you see at the top. Of. But if you now organize them according to which cells are most correlated with each other. So you start out with one of the cells and then ask, uh, arrange the cells according to which is uh, most correlated with the reference cell, the second one most correlated, and the third one, and so on. Then you get what you see there. And on the x-axis, you have time of approximately one hour. And then uh, you have each line uh, is um, one cell. And uh, you can then see that these cells go through a certain sequence where cell A fires cell B, cell D, cell uh, E, cell F, and so on. And then it goes through that cycle uh, over and over and over again as long as they run uh, in this task. Of course, this is a very special task. It's very stripped off from information from sensory information, but it shows that it is possible, the, the brain has the potential to form sequences of very long at behavioral timescales. Um, and uh, as you see, this is of course not uh, individual sequences, it goes around and around. So it is, uh, if you use uh, the same dimensionality reduction techniques, you can see that it actually goes in, in, in circles. And uh, this is just a time scale, approximately a minute uh, on average, can be longer, a little bit shorter. And it's independent of the mouse's uh, behavior. So uh, when it's, it also continues to happen when the mouse is uh, sitting still. But quite often they stop and just sit there for a while and then they start running again. So um, with that, uh, I, want, uh, I do have three slides after this, but I want to sum up now where we are. So I... Um, I mentioned to you uh, the work on uh, space and I told you that uh, we are now in a position where it's possible to study the collaborative behavior of uh, hundreds to thousands of cells, how they work together. You can use uh, 
mathematics, uh, statistics to visualize how the activity, the joint activity moves around on what you call manifolds and then uh, in, in our case for the grid cell they move around on a torus and stay there, can never get out of it, uh, by the way also solves the uh, end of the world problem because if it had been a, a flat surface we never know what would happen when they get to the end but on a torus you just move around and move around so it's it's a quite smart way to design a space system. Um, I talked about time and uh, first about duration and they said that the activity in the lateral part of entorhinal cortex which speaks to the hippocampus changes over time in proportion to the passage of time but it's not linear, so when important things happen, then it goes faster. When boring, it's boring, then it goes a little bit slower. And also that events, things that happen, can break up the sequence. Uh, and uh, I think the, there much, there's a lot that suggests that um, experience is not a, a steady flow of uh, changes in this brain. It is organized in segments, and those segments are... Um, are uh, dependent on um, what on the events, what we experience as uh, discrete events, and when we then recall the whole thing back from memory later, we tend to remember those events. So, if there were many events, you can imagine that it's experienced as or remembered as a much longer, uh, eventful uh, uh, memory. Finally, I said that uh, the brain has uh, the ability to organize its activity in sequences. Uh, even at the scale of uh, minutes and uh, I think um, the fact that such oscillations exist doesn't mean that this is probably not the way the brain works when we are running around and experiencing the world but it shows that the brain has the capacity for generating very long sequences and uh, if it is there it's much easier to use it when you need it. So during the first, uh, the last three minutes I want to say a little bit about the implications of this uh, uh, for disease. So first of all, everything I told you so far is what you call basic research. So it's uh, about trying to find out how the normal brain works. But obviously, this is what we have to do if we want to understand uh, disease. And that uh, is not only neurological, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson, but also all psychiatric conditions uh, uh, depend on the very functions that uh, that uh, I, I told you about. Space and time are maybe not the ones you first think of, but, um, but that we use space and time as a gateway into understanding cognition in, in the brain. And then uh, I think that we, if you understand how those are computed in the brain, we can also get to more complex uh, issues like uh, planning and thinking and uh, organization of behavior uh, and so on. So, uh, but then, regarding space and time, uh, there is some obvious link to uh, Alzheimer's disease. And it turns out that the brain areas that are first affected, at least in the cortex, uh, is the entorhinal cortex. That's where the neurodegeneration begins. That's where the neurofibrillary tangles uh, uh, start and you get phosphorylation of tau proteins. So the whole pathological process uh, uh, in the brain associated with Alzheimer is very often uh, uh, expressed first in the entorhinal cortex and especially in the lateral entorhinal cortex. You see that here. This is an, uh, uh, an this is um, uh, an um, image of. Uh, of the activity of uh, these brain areas, the medial and the lateral, and, uh, and um, where it starts and how much before it starts. So in, uh, in, uh, this is uh, actually a, a measure of the volume of tissue in these brain areas, and you can see that volume loss starts out first in lateral and then spreads to the medial and then to the hippocampus. And uh, you see examples of the cell death here. So to the left you have a normal brain, uh, to the right you have an Alzheimer's brain, and in the middle you have what you call often media, uh, uh, mild cognitive uh, impairment, which is sort of pre-Alzheimer. And you see that the cell loss starts there. It's quite selective in this brain area uh, before it then spreads uh, to, to hippocampus and to rhinal and then the rest of the brain. And of course this explains why Alzheimer's disease is linked to spatial disorientation, confusion about time, and of course also loss of memory, which are the functions that these uh, brain areas are responsible for. 
and um, I don't have to tell anyway anyone that uh, Alzheimer's disease is a growing health uh, <coughs> problem, much because of uh, age, uh, and you can see the percentage of population uh, suffering from Alzheimer is really increasing after the age of uh, 85. Uh, 80 to 85, up to 25 percent or so uh, in 85 uh, plus. And uh, as you all know, the population is getting older, so I only have some random numbers here. Uh, I do not have South Africa, but I do have Gersney. <laughs> so you can see that uh, uh, there is over a period of approximately 15 years, uh, uh, lifespan, expected lifespan increases by almost four years. And uh, that's all over the world. So that um, it just means that many people, many, many more, get in, it will suffer from Alzheimer unless we find a cure. And I think the fact that we now know where it starts, we know what these brain areas do, that will also help uh, 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 help research that uh, focuses more specifically on uh, finding causes of Alzheimer and eventually finding a cure. Although. Um, my interest will always be in understanding the normal brain because I think that has the, the biggest consequences because it can reach out to all diseases that affect the brain and approximately third, one third of all diseases are somehow counted as brain related. So it, it's a fair share of all diseases. So with that, I just want to say there are many people involved. I have mentioned many of them. My group most are in uh, basically all of the work and then I mentioned the others. They are listed here. And many people have paid for that, that is at the bottom. So with that, I just want to thank you for the attention and uh, happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right. So yeah, we do have some time for questions. I just have to figure out how to um, will you get the online questions yes. here? Okay, all right, because we'll have questions from the audience here and, uh, and so, uh, anyone? Uh, George? Um, thank you for the great lecture. I have two... Yeah, thank you for the great lecture. I have two very different questions. The first one is that the place cells are in a Euclidean coordinate and the vector direction cells are uh, spherical polar. So these mice are doing uh, trigonometry, they're calculating sines and cosines of how they're doing this. And, and related to this is that um, when it's running this way, the direction cells are, are fixed in the body or in the surrounding. Okay. That's the first question. Yeah, yeah, no, I should have said the, the latter, begin with the latter, which is the easier one. So it's uh, uh, the, the direction cells and also the grid cells, everything is a reference to, to the local environment. So it, here it would be the walls, the rooms, because, uh, I mean, straight boundaries are very useful as references for space, and that's what they use. It's not the magnetic north, for example, so, or, or south, would you say here. So, um, uh, so that's the reference for the direction. And when it comes to uh, um, the, whether it's Euclid Euclidean or uh, vector-based, I, I think uh, I, I, I think I don't see why they can't speak together. That's probably what they do. How they do it, uh, that is still for the future. So, one of the things that we have to find out. Thank you. The second question I seem to recall, and this is much more controversial. Someone claimed that ideas were somehow related also. I can't, I can't remember that. You can probably remind me what that is. Um, ideas. That, yeah, similar ideas were uh, uh, in some part of the brain and in, in close... Mm. I, I can't remember. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, similar ideas uh, are probably related because that's how um, uh, thoughts uh, are created and memories. Uh, by having cells that encode uh, for similar properties of uh, very often talk together. So they may be in different parts of the brain, but it all depends on these connections uh, uh, and uh, which ones form synapses with each other and which ones uh, don't. So I mentioned that when, when it came to uh, space, right? So uh, I just mentioned it, I showed only one slide because it got too theoretical. But the idea is that the way you can create a map in the brain 
is by having cells that encode similar positions, grid cells that encode similar positions, being connected, and those that encode different positions are not connected or even inhibiting each other. And if, if you do this, then you can actually create maps that have the properties we observe, even a torus-shaped map. So that's for space, but there's, uh, most likely this also happens at more abstract levels. So in thinking, abstract thinking, um, I would think that uh, cells that um, encode similar parts of our experience are connected and somehow activate each other. Uh, and then uh, a memory, for example, is the concurrent activation of cells that uh, represent something out there, but in the brain. Uh, functional um, MRI uh, using radio, uh, yeah, using isotopes of carbon in glucose. Wouldn't that be something that can augment an understanding of activity in real time? Sure. And where, where is it used, and could you use it? Yeah. Board? Both yes and no. So it is very much uh, used and uh, it's a very helpful tool for understanding uh, the brain in, uh, uh, and its operation in real time and not the least in humans. So you don't have to go to mice, for example. But uh, the disadvantage is at the same time that you don't have the resolution uh, neither in space nor in time that you have with the other tools that I, I showed. So. Um, for example, if you take uh, the space circuit in the entorhinal cortex or in the hippocampus, it consists of cells with different properties, but they are intermingled so that a great grid cell is, for example, next to an object vector cell is next to a border cell and so on. So if you don't have sufficient spatial resolution, which you don't have with fMRI, you will just see the average and it's very hard to see something. But that said, there are signatures that have been recorded from um, cells in the entorhinal cortex in humans that have been related to grid cells. Um, it is still somewhat controversial whether it really is grid cells or not, but um, this is work in progress and, uh, and I think you can get some distance, but if you want cellular resolution, if you want really highly, temp highly temporal resolution, you still have to record from individual cells at the same time. Um, yes, please go ahead. Um, thank you for that excellent lecture. So I understand your research has given us such incredible insights into how the internal cortex um, subsumes elements of time, space, integration in the mind. But how do lesion-based studies of the internal cortex? What are the functional impairments that arise when the internal cortex is damaged? Yeah. Now uh, that's um, an important question. So. If, you, if the entorhinal dam, uh, cortex is damaged, which happens uh, quite often in, uh, in um, lesions that involve the temporal lobe, it's rarely only the entorhinal cortex, but very often hippocampus plus entorhinal cortex, then, uh, uh, then uh, it's loss of memory, it is loss of, um, of uh, ability to navigate uh, and uh, also to organize uh, events um, in time. So uh, quite often this is what you see in early stages of Alzheimer's disease, right? Because these are the areas that are first damaged. So uh, you don't, don't re you lose recent memories and uh, you can't find your way, uh, you get lost and uh, also get confused about uh, how org uh, events are organized in time. So previously this was um, investigated in uh, experimental animals, rats, mice, and uh, if you then inactivate those areas or make lesions in this, those areas, you will find they can't find their way in a, in a maze, for example. So, and, and they also are poor in memory tasks. So it all fits together. Um, so th this has been known for quite a while, but uh, then uh, what we now work on is to go to the single cell level and see how they create it. But, um, a damage to that brain area is, is inevitably going to function to affect both uh, space, time and memories. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, 
Thank you very much for a really, really fascinating talk. And uh, just to qualify, I'm not a neuroscientist, so excuse me if the question's a bit oblique. But um, your image in your summary slide in the time section, where you showed the encoding of memory in the brain with sort of sequence aspect to it, yeah, yeah. it's very reminiscent of the diagrams that people with synesthesia draw when they're coding um, numbers over time or dates in a sequence over time. And I was just worried, uh, wondering if this work um, with word cells has ever been related to synesthesia and um, looked at any associations there. Um, yeah, I, I, I think not directly, but what, 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 I, what I would think is uh, that the brain is quite good at, at discretizing experiences, whether, what, whatever it is related to. So that uh, relates to how you interpret the sensory inputs that you get or whether you, how you organize the experience. And uh, what that diagram showed is that uh, even if experience is a flow of events, then the brain tends to remember it in chunks. And uh, that is sort of what you recall when you put it back. Power. But uh, I, I think that's probably what I can say. Yeah, there may be similarities, but it's a, at a very general level. Good. I think we have to bring the formal part of the question and answer session to an end. There'll be time afterwards for uh, further discussions. Uh, let me ask uh, Professor Graham Fegan, who is Director of the Neuroscience Institute, who is going to uh, deliver some closing remarks and a vote of thanks. Thanks. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much, VC. So I'd like to start by echoing your appreciation for this wonderful lecture we've had by Professor Moser. And I think the, the full auditorium and nearly 100 people online really attest to what a beautiful lecture this was and what a privilege it's been to hear you. So, so Edward, you, you, you showed the human brain may be complex and hard to study, as you put it, uh, but certainly it's, it's worth the effort. And here in the Neuroscience Institute, our vision is in Africa where people achieve their full potential through brain health, and as you've shown very beautifully through the trajectory of your lecture, understanding the fundamental process of the brain kind of lead us to that. Um, I was asked to summarize the lecture, which is quite a quite a tall ask, um, but just I think really a, a few key things that, that resonated was when, when you spoke about the, the psychology physiology barrier and how we have this challenge of trying to understand how 100 billion, I thought 100 billion neurons with each with about 10,000 connections, uh, understanding those interactions leads to, to human behavior and the way in which your work has has used um, assessment of space and time to really start to understand those higher cognitive processes. I love the way you describe the hippocampus as a map that encodes where you are and the experience of where you are. And the way you describe memory as being um, space and time combining to, to form memories. And I think that, that's a very, very evocative description. So we've been incredibly privileged to hear an amazing uh, exposition of of, uh, as Professor Armando said, Nobel Prize winning work, which one had very seldom has the opportunity to do. So, so thank you very much for that. And it's a great pleasure to hand over a gift and, and thank you so much for your lecture. So, I, I do have a couple of other thanks to express. Um, <laughs> so just to, to thank um, people who made this lecture possible, so colleagues in the Communications and Marketing Department in, and the Information Communication Technology Services, Marlon being in the front rank of that, and, and staff of the Neuroscience Institute who played a, a big role in organizing this. Uh, a special thank you to Joe for his introductory remarks. I, I do want to acknowledge all our guests. So. Um, uh, Professor Moses here with uh, Dr. McLean Bolton, who herself is a very distinguished neuroscientist. Professor Tobias Bonhoeffer, who is in fact not just uh, director of the Max Planck Institute for Neurobiology, but also an honorary professor here at UCT, uh, together with uh, Dr. Imke Gurdicke. And uh, as um, Edward acknowledged, a real sincere word of thanks to, to Ursel and, and David for your amazing hospitality as always and looking, helping look after our guests. Thank you. Thank you so much. You've everything we've ever done in the Neuroscience Institute has been there to support us. So thank you so much for that. 
Um, so for those of you online, I'm sorry I can't offer you drinks and snacks, but for those of you in the room, uh, please come and join us outside and we can continue the conversation, after which you'll drive home safely now that you've figured out the way your brain navigates through space and time. Thank you very much.